evening. Welcome to our Twilight Tech Talk. This is the first in a series of six events that we're going to be doing during the prolonged Twilight Cruise Night events. Uh, my name is Peter Tridy. I am the test group manager at Gale Banks Engineering. And uh, my boss, Gale Banks, is uh, he's a gearhead and a hot rodder. And uh, he's also got a little bit of an engineering bent. He's, he really likes, one of his passions is finding horsepower in engines. And a lot of people will remember that um, throughout his career, he's used turbocharging pretty extensively. That's really what he's probably most known for. Um, as far as his career goes, he's been in business for about 55 years. And you can actually see a record of that whole entire career right here at the Wally Parks NHRA Motorsports Museum. So just come on by and take a look and you'll, uh, you'll be able to see some of uh, the, the milestones along the way. Another thing that Gail's kind of known for is uh, getting a lot of horsepower out of diesel engines. A lot of people associate him with diesel engines. Please uh, join me in welcoming Gail Banks. Thank you, sir. So Gail, tonight our topic is suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Right. Now, we all know, I mean, I think probably most of us here know that that's kind of a, a fun way to talk about the four-stroke process. Yeah. Um, and, and we're, we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about each of the four strokes. We're going to talk about, you know, kind of the mechanics of it all. But maybe I think a good place to start with this would be right at the very beginning. So could you maybe take us all the way back to when the four-stroke engine was first created and, and how that even came about? Yeah, that, that came about in 1885. A guy named Nicholas Otto was working with internal combustion. Up to that point, everything was external combustion, steam engines. They were really inefficient. And he had some ideas. Uh, his initial engine blew a piston vertically, and then it latched onto a rack, and the weight of the piston produced the power. Well, that was quite a contraption, really Rube, Rube Goldberg. Uh, then he came up with the idea of the four-stroke process. So we have Nick Otto to thank, and of course it's O-T-T-O, -T -T not A-U-T-O. Now the, it's, so, so that, I mean that four-stroke process, that, that's essentially the same type of engines we have in cars and trucks today. Absolutely. I mean his, his invention enabled the uh, patent car to be produced. Uh, which happened in uh, in Germany, I think about 1886. The so, Benz so the very first car, car it was had the first a four-stroke engine. It wasn't Henry Ford, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of got that going, and then uh, Rudolf Diesel uh, patented the diesel process in the early 1890s. Got it. So all this stuff didn't happen yesterday. Uh, it's it's evolved tremendously. Now, obviously, there's a lot of differences. I mean, if we look at, we've got a cutaway of a, of a Duramax yeah. diesel engine here, and I mean, there's a lot of stuff up here. There's, there's a turbocharger, there's emissions equipment, there's a lot going on, and uh, so, so that's all, you know, kind of been added on, but really, that four-stroke process has stayed pretty much the same throughout. It hasn't changed at all. Uh, as we go through this series of tech talks, we'll, we'll get to the milestones. Uh, Today, we just want to talk about the process itself. And it's, it's pretty ele elemental. Uh, you've got your internal combustion engine. Uh, here we're showing a Chevy V8, big block. It inducts air, it mix, mixes fuel with it. The air-fuel mixture go goes into the cylinder, it's combusted. That energy is, turns the crankshaft through the piston and rod assembly, and out comes uh, a whole lot of exhaust energy, which is wasted. It just heats the world. So the combustion process we're working on and have been working on, making it more efficient. Got it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when we talk about efficiency, gasoline engines today are not really all that efficient when you when it really boils down to it, right? I mean, we're talking what 25, 28 percent, somewhere in that range. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. really about the energy we get out of that fuel. Yeah. For every every thousand horsepower worth of fuel you put in the tank, you get about two, 280 horsepower at the flywheel, and then you lose some of that getting it to the road surface. Yeah. All the rest of it. All the rest of that energy goes to heat through friction uh, of one form or another. And we'll talk about that down the road in it. So let's talk. maybe, let's take the four strokes apart. So yeah. the, first one we, the first one in the list is, is suck. 
Now that that's that's how we're, we're really talking about an intake stroke. Here, yeah, so. where did where did suck, squeeze, bang, blow come from? Yeah, um, it's, uh, it had to be uh, some hot rod or somewhere. It actually line, came sure. from the Navy. I was doing a, a gradu graduation up at Port Wyneme for a big group of CBs and, and talking to them about the kind of stuff we're talking about here. And uh, one of the instructors said that, and I went. I like that better than intake compression, power, and exhaust. Well, you know, one of the uh, one of the <laughs> things we're learning about those, easier to remember. those Navy guys is they, they are hot rodders. I mean, oh, they, yeah. they want to get in and get out, and to do that, you got to have some horsepower. They especially so. want to get out. When, when it gets really, really hot for them, yeah. they want to do what we used to call get, get the hell out of Dodge, but today they call it E&E, &E, escape and evade. So well, let's talk about the four strokes. So the yes. first one that we've got is the intake stroke. Maybe just walk us through what's going on during, uh, during the intake stroke. Well, the, on the intake stroke, the intake valve is open. The crankshaft is pulling the piston down in the bore, forming a vacuum in the cylinder. And the air rushes in. The higher pressure outside air rushes into the cylinder and fills it. Got it. Now, are we talking so, about air alone? Are we talking about air and fuel mixed together? It depends on what you're doing. Um, of course, with a carburetor, it's air and fuel. Uh, as we go to fuel injection, of course, now we're injecting the fuel uh, right upstream from the intake valve. And with direct gas injection, we're injecting the fuel in the cylinder like a diesel. Kind of like a diesel, yeah. Yeah, a lot of gasoline engines are becoming more, more like a diesel. Yeah. That's, that's happening. Uh, turbocharging and direct injection being two of the elements. Got it. So, so, so the piston comes down on the bore, pulls that, sucks, literally sucks that air fuel mixture into that bore. Exactly. And then we close the intake valve and that takes us to our next stroke, right? Right. Now we're compressing the mixture or the air, depending on when you get the fuel into the process. Uh, as you reach top dead center, you've got a, a situation where, where if you're injecting directly into the cylinder, it's injected and then fired. Got it. So that helps the torque output of a gasoline engine, something fierce doing it that way. So when we talk about the compression stroke, this is actually, this is the part of the process where we can talk a little, we could talk about compression ratio, where we're, we're taking a certain volume and squeezing it into a tighter volume, right? Exactly. Okay. And we're going to light the fire as the piston gets near top dead center, we're, we're going to light the fire and that produces what, what I call negative work. Mm. But we want the peak cylinder pressure to happen after top dead center. Somewhere between 12 and 18 degrees after top dead center is the range, depending on the geometry of the engine, the stroke, the rod length, and all of that jive. But on the, on the power stroke, as the piston comes up on the compression stroke, you light the fire, and you push it against that growing pressure over top dead center. So in order to get that peak cylinder pressure at that 18 degrees or so after top dead center, we have to we actually have to we start have to light before, the fire before top, before dead, top center. dead center. Before Which is center. called advanced, spark advance. Yeah, okay. Now, um, again, let's just kind of distinguish between gasoline and diesel. On a gasoline engine, we start this combustion process with uh, with a spark plug. Exactly. How do we how does that happen in a diesel? I know diesels don't have spark plugs. In a diesel, and our, our illustration actually shows a diesel, the heat of compression is adequate. Once you start injecting the fuel into that hot air, it immediately ignites. There's virtually no delay in a modern diesel. Got it. So the timing of the engine has to do with when you start the injection. So it simply has to do with heat. That's really what's, it's what's starting that heat fire. It starts the fire. Got it. So this is the this is the bang, the the, the combustion that's taking exactly. place in the there power is, stroke. is our power stroke, and that's what's actually pushing that piston down in the bore, mm -hmm. transferring that energy into the crankshaft. Exactly. So now the crankshaft is spinning and we're, we're getting that linear motion and changing it into rotary motion. Yes. And, uh, and, tra and now we have power that we can tr transmit to the rest of the, uh, and, of the drive. And, 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 and this is the only of the four strokes, the, uh, this one is aptly named, it's power. It's the only one that makes power. Mm -hmm. The other, th the, uh, in other words, it's putting power into the rotating crankshaft. The other three take power out of the rotating crankshaft as part of running the engine, the so process. So we actually, we, we actually have to make enough power during the power stroke to not only 
power the vehicle, but we have to overcome those other strokes. Exactly. So that there's, there's an added burden exactly. during that power yes. stroke. So that's part of that efficiency that we were talking about. That's where some of that's going to be lost, yeah. right? Yeah. In the, and, and is that what we would call pumping losses? Is that kind of the, yeah. the term that might be used there? On the intake and the exhaust, those are pumping losses. Got it. Yeah. So we've covered three of the four. The fourth one is our exhaust stroke. This exactly. is the blow part of our process. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, maybe walk us through what's happening during the exhaust stroke? Well, as the piston gets near bottom dead center on the power stroke, the exhaust valve starts opening. Okay. Ideally, when the piston hits the bottom, the pressure in the cylinder is the same as the pressure in the exhaust manifold, and then it just rises against that pressure. That happens at one specific RPM. Oh, okay. But you can't change that opening point it w with current technology easily. Right. Now you can move the camshaft. Mm -hmm. That helps you move that valve opening point. Got it. So the higher the RPM you're going, the earlier you want to open the exhaust valve to blow it down. So that's what that's the, some of the newer technology where they have variable valve timing. Exactly. That's, that's one of the, the benefits that we can get. And from we'll them. be getting into that too. Got it. So, so so now that piston's traveling up. It's literally pushing those exhaust gases out of the cylinder. Right. Okay. And uh, as we run through this process, as we already mentioned, only one of these strokes is actually producing power. The other three are parasitic. Exactly. They're taking power away. And the compression stroke, you really, you can't do much there. Yeah. You have to have that. Right. But right. the intake and the exhaust stroke, there's some opportunity there. Ah, all right. So I think mm -hmm. we'll probably shed a little more light on that a yeah. little bit later, too. Yeah. Um, now, we've, we've gone through, we've, we've got four strokes. We've gone through basically two complete revolutions of the crankshaft. Am I right? Yep. So 720 degrees of, of crankshaft rotation it takes to complete that four-stroke process. Right. So during that time, we've, we've moved that piston through its, its mechanical design. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, we've got a bore, we've got a stroke, so we, our displacement's pretty well set. It takes those two full revolutions to displace the full volume, volume of the engine. Volume of the engine. Yeah. Got it. So, um, so with those, those two revolutions, we can, we can move all the volume that's, that, that that engine is capable yeah, of moving. If, if, if it's a 427, it displaces 427 cubic inches in two revs. During those revs. Got yeah. it. Okay. Or half its displacement per rev. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's, uh, that, that, I think that's going to be a key point when we start looking at some of the math that's involved a little bit later. Let, I want to talk a little bit about what happens. We, we've done an intake, compression, power, and exhaust. We've got our four strokes. What, we've got a, that, that's a repeating process, right? I mean, we're just going to keep repeating that process over and over. So at the end of the exhaust stroke, we have, we're, we're now transitioning over to the beginning of the intake mm -hmm. stroke. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a little bit of period of time in a lot of engines where there might be, both the valves might be open at the same time. In almost every engine. Okay. Of course, uh, the hotter the camshaft, the more the valve overlap. And that's, that's when you get that nice lumpy yeah, sound. Yeah, and right? what you guys are looking at right now is the valve overlap. The piston is nearing top dead center. Uh, the, the exhaust valve will close after the piston crowns at TDC and starts down. And the intake valve will chase the piston down the bore and fully open. So if I so, had to guess, during that time, if we don't get all those exhaust gases out, we could kind of contaminate our incoming air. We may, we yeah, may have... It's kind of like poor man's exhaust recirculation. Yeah, you know? yeah probably not what we really want. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> we want to get, I, I would imagine we want to get some cool fresh air into the cylinder. So if we have maybe a lot of exhaust restriction, could that be a, one of the things that might contribute to, yeah, to this? Yeah, kind of yeah, guys talk about exhaust restriction, and, and there's an old wives' tale that you've got to have a little bit of back pressure or it won't work right. Uh, that's not so. Okay. You want no back pressure. If anything, you want a vacuum at the exhaust valve when it opens. Scavenging. That has to do with tuning headers. Got it. So, and similarly on the intake side, you want the ability to fill the cylinder completely with fresh air. Right. And fuel if it's pre-mixed. Yeah, got so. it. Okay, so, so the, the intake stroke and the exhaust stroke, we talked about inefficiencies during the during those strokes like yeah. we, the compression stroke is pretty well set we're kind of we're kind of tied to that but it's the intake stroke and the exhaust stroke where we might have some opportunities for improvement yeah the intake stroke you're looking for a cool uh, charge of ram air mm -hmm. uh, on the exhaust stroke you're, you're looking for scavenging in the in the exhaust system uh, so that 
NASCAR, Formula One, those guys have really, really got a science they've, going So they've there. figured it out. They've figured it out. And when you do it right, what happens is what you see now in the cylinder, you're at valve overlap, but you've got a completely fresh charge in the cylinder. And oh, by the way, as the piston came up to force the exhaust out, the load on the piston head was lower. So there's, a, so there's an added bonus there. Yeah. You get a little bit uh, extra uh, uh, it reduction. It makes the in engine more efficient. Yeah. Or it makes the engine make more power on the same fuel. Ah, so I get a, yeah. there's kind of a choice there. If I, I, I might get, if, I'm, if I really need it, I can have more power. Or if, you, or if, if you're I'm just, just cruising, cruising, you're going to have better mileage. Get better fuel economy. Yeah. Which would, I mean, that's always a plus. Yes, absolutely it is. So we've, we've kind of talked through the four-stroke process. Now we've got a pretty good understanding of, of getting the air into the engine. Mm -hmm. We've mixed it with fuel. We're burning that fuel. We're getting rid of the, what's left over. Now maybe you can help me understand a little bit about the, the mechanics of this. Let, I mean, let, let's bring it into some real world technology. Okay. okay. How, how can we know, if I'm building an engine, how do I know how much air I need, how much fuel I'm going to need to make you know, a certain amount of horsepower? Well, you know, there's a, an air-fuel ratio. Uh, gasoline runs in a very narrow air-fuel ratio range, uh, unlike diesels. Mm -hmm. uh, but this isn't a talk on diesel, this is a talk on gasoline. The, uh, we always talk about air-fuel ratio in mass. And, and, and we talk, here on the West Coast, where we're further <laughs> away from Europe and not using, uh, you know, uh, their units. I still use pounds, uh, not kilograms, but pounds. Got it. So hold so, your applause. So that's and, what we and, care and, about. And, and, so that's what we care about. It's it's how, how many, many pounds, pounds of, fuel of fuel and how many pounds of air. Got it. To get the right air fuel ratio. Got it. So if you're idling in in current technology engines, uh, you're at what's called stoichiometric. That's a chemically perfect air fuel mixture. Uh, you've got enough oxygen to burn all the fuel. And that's 14.7 to once. 14.7 pounds of air to one pound of fuel. Okay. As you go up in power, you richen it. And this has to do with detonation more than anything. We've okay. got given octane fuel. Uh, if, you, if you go too, too far in terms of temperature in the cylinder, it'll detonate. Got it. Uh, and we want to prevent that, so we richen the engine as we go to additional power to prevent the detonation and, and, re, and realize the best power versus fuel consumption out of the engine. Okay. So moderate power, you'd go maybe 14 to 1. You'd richen it up. Okay. When you go to wide open throttle, 13 and a half to 12 and a half to 1. That's when I'm at the drag strip. I'm full on the throttle. Yeah. I'm going down. Yeah, if, you, if you get past 12 and a half to 1, you better visit your engine, the, the whole it's engine It's to do design. a little more tuning. Yeah. All right. uh, you know, you don't want fuel running out of the tailpipe. Yeah. Yeah. So, so but if I go, yeah. if I start getting below that number, I'm probably, I, I've got unburned fuel in the cylinder. I'm not making full, full exactly. use of the fuel. Yeah. Okay. It may be giving You've me some cooling. You've got unburned fuel leaving the cylinder. Yeah. It yeah. may be giving me some cooling properties, but it's it, not it, going to contribute to it power. It might be. Okay. So we've got a range that anywhere at, 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 at idle, we were 14.7 to 1 mm -hmm. probably. And, mm -hmm. and we're talking here primarily about electronically controlled engines because we, we have all the necessary sensors to do that. Carburetors are going to get close to they that. They tend to do that. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. Carburetor so, tends to track it too. Yeah. So this is the range that we're working mm -hmm. with. And again, we're talking about pounds. It's, it's the mass of the air and the fuel going through the engine exactly. that, that, we're, that we're really dealing with. So um, when, we get to, when we get to making power, mm -hmm. obviously I know, I mean, that to make more power, I, I have to have more fuel going through the engine. The, I'm getting, the, the energy is stored in the fuel. But to burn more fuel, you've got to have more air. Because I have to maintain that air fuel ratio. Exactly. Got it. So, you, so more air becomes really critical. Yes. So that, you that, want I'm not to find make, out about detonation, lean it out. Okay. So I'm not going to. You buy the pistol. I'm not going to be able to so, make more power unless I get that, uh, that air into the exactly. engine. Exactly. So. We could say then that, that our power output is air limited. It's limited by the amount of air that we can get. Absolutely. That is an absolute. Got it. So let's look at like a, 
uh, a real optimized engine then. Let's mm -hmm. let's take uh, you know like a NASCAR style engine, 358 cubic inches right. um, of a V8 making uh, 865 horsepower at about 9400 RPM. That's kind of the state of the art these days. Yeah, um, that would be state of the art for a p pure gasoline. Got it. Uh, they are a little less now because they're running E85. With, with the, with the but we're going to talk pure gasoline. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, so we've got an optimized engine. Can we? Can you maybe walk us through a little bit of uh, the numbers? What are we? Well, uh, what are we talking to, about? You know, airflow? it's really how do we? Get, how, we need to know how many pounds of air that thing will pump at 9,400 RPM. Got it. Before we add the fuel. Right. It's 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 like a recipe. You're baking a cake. If, if you don't get it right, the cake doesn't rise. Right. Or if you don't get get it right, you buy the engine, yeah. which is a little rougher than a bad cake. So. <laughs> 9,400 RPM, uh, the engine displaces 974 cubic feet per minute. Got it. All right. That's it. Okay. All right. So that's, that's how much, that, that, with those two revolutions that we talked about, right. and at that, at that speed, that's how much air we're, we're able to move through the engine. Yeah. So let, we, let's talk about weight, though. We were talking about the mass of that air, the pounds. Can we get to that from... Uh, from those numbers? Yeah, it's common. The correction factor uh, gives you the basic ma mass, air mass. Uh, and when you're dynoing an engine, it's common in the racing industry, and used to be very common in the automotive industry, to correct your readings to 60 degrees Fahrenheit and sea level. Okay. Which is barometric pressure. So you've got a pressure and a temperature. Fairly close to sea level here, so it'd be it'd be kind of comparable to what we deal yeah. with around around. And here. if it's sixty degrees out, the air, the weight of the air, would be 0775 pounds, point oh seven seven five pounds per cubic foot. Okay, got it. So that yeah. that's how much it actually weighs. Exactly. Okay. So now let's let's take it to the next step. Then mm -hmm. um, we know that the engine is it's it's going to pump its its fixed displacement. It's got a bore and a stroke that we're working with, and although every two revolutions it pumps that displacement. Right. So what what are we dealing with when, to 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 figure out the quality of that air that we're moving through? Well, the, the quality, you know, what we just talked about is called air density. It's in this room. We need to get that density into the cylinder. Uh huh. More specifically, into the intake manifold, Got past it. the venturis in the in the carburetor or whatever other restriction exists. If there's an air filter, if there's a exactly, you know, it could be any number of things that that could mm -hmm. that we would have to route that air through. So the the key to greater power is greater intake density, Got what it. we call ID. So, so we're looking for we're, a greater intake density. That's what we're looking for. Okay. Mm -hmm. It, and, and if you really do it right, if, if you properly tune the thing, and then this has to do with tuned intake manifolds, this has to do with cold ram air, you can actually get greater density in the intake manifold than is outside the vehicle. Really? Yeah. So that's, that's finding all the inefficiencies and optimizing everything that we can. And, and, and throwing a little intake tuning science in. Got it. And a little ram air. Okay. All so, right, so uh, so how do you how do you do that? How do you get above atmospheric in, in, in that intake manifold? Well, it starts with presenting the your air inlet dire directly in the direction of the car. In other words, you want air to ram straight into your air inlet. So this is how I did it in 1958. I took a headlight out of my Studebaker. This would be at El Mirage, and uh, found a air inlet that I could put a piece of four inch like dryer vent on <laughs> nice. and, and I made a ram air set up so, so I took you know you know in a normal intake system in, in a car you're actually heating the air mm -hmm. that's part of the problem yeah and you're dropping pressure because there are restrictions in that so I had a, a 327 a 337 inch small block Chevy in this thing and um with a Rochester fuel injector. So I just ran that line right to the Rochester inlet. Nice. And all of a sudden, I had more power than when the headlight was there. So you're, you're actually able to get more intake density, ID, because you're because pressurizing I'm ramming air. it in, so I've got greater than barometric pressure. And, and not only are you pressurizing it, mm -hmm. but you're also grabbing the coolest air available. Exactly. 
Got it. Okay, so now I will tell you, they outlawed that <laughs> immediately. The rule book got changed. As soon as that, so, that shows, yeah, you don't get to do that anymore. <laughs> gotcha. The headlights have to stay. Ah, yeah. okay. So it's On a, a gas. Rule. This is a gas class car. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so what kind of effect can we expect from that kind of uh, of a ram air setup? I'm always looking for about one and a half psi uh, I increase. It depends on how fast the car goes. So as you, as you get more and more successful at going fast, you get better and better ram air. Yeah. So the number, uh, you know, <laughs> if I'm running a car around two, 200, 225, 250, somewhere in there, I'm looking for about a pound and a half of ram pressure. Uh, and that changes the density from that prior number to, to this number about 10% higher okay. in the intake manifold. Now, part of that is also the design of the intake manifold. Okay. There's a thing called resonance. You guys have seen ram tubes before, uh, but intake manifolds with carburetor, carburetors, as used in NASCAR or tunnel rams that guys use in drag racing, those are all tuning to a certain RPM and ramming as a as a an, an effect of that. So you're basically getting a, a an acoustic or a sonic effect right. in the design of the intake manifold to help that process. Exactly. Along. Got it. All right. So now let's let's, let's let's give me a little bit more math here on how we get to the the weight of that air, the exactly. weight of the fuel that's that's going into. This the is part of the key is how this small block Chevy NASCAR engine, this 258 inches, makes 885 horsepower mm -hmm. at 9400 RPM. Uh, if it just had the normal setup you'd have on a street hot rod with a carburetor. The carburetor produces a vacuum underneath of it at wide open throttle. If it's an 850 Holley, it, it loses an inch and a half of mercury just going through the, the carburetor. Here we've got a situation where we've overcome all of that. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, NASCAR engines are now fuel injected, but they have something that looks like a carburetor still on the there. The throttle body. The throttle body. Mm -hmm. Uh, but basically, we now are 974 CFM with, with a higher intake density has a, a mass of 83.1 pounds of minute of air. Wow, okay. So, and if we, if we look at our, these engines run, run at about a 13 and a half to one air fuel ratio. The NASCAR engines run what I'd call lean. They're masters of It's this. a little bit above that 12 and a half to one yeah. that we're talking about. And uh, so if you take your 83 pounds of air and you divide that by, by your air fuel ratio, 13 and a half, you come up with, with a gasoline flow of 6.16 pounds per minute. Got it. So now, Which is right at a gallon. So that, that, yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah. that tells us kind of what our fuel system needs to be capable of. Exactly. In order to, to make that kind of exactly. horsepower. Exactly. Okay. So now we, we take it to... When we talk about engine efficiency, we look at how much fuel does it take to run to make one horsepower for an hour. Okay. And the old rule of thumb was a half a pound of fuel to, to make one horsepower for an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, or what we call a brake specific number of 500.500. Okay. So if we take the 6.16 pounds per minute times 60 minutes, we come up with a flow rate of 369.6 pounds per hour. Okay. Uh, it, it, to make 865 horsepower. So if we then divide the 369 by the 865, that being the horsepower output, right. we, we come up with our brake specific fuel consumption. And then, it, it, I love the number, 427. <laughs> so we have a 427 brake spec. That's real efficient. So this NASCAR engine that we're talking about, now yeah. we've, we've kind of wheedled it down to figure out like how much fuel they're, they're needing to burn to get exactly. this power out of it. Exactly. And it's a pretty efficient number, is what you're saying. Yeah, a 427 is very efficient. Uh, diesels, some diesels, that are older diesels. Mm -hmm. Diesels are m much better on brake specific. Okay. They're more fuel efficient. Uh, that's common knowledge. So pounds per horsepower hour is, is the measure of engine efficiency. Okay. And the term brake specific fuel consumption or BSFC is. 
So that's the number. That's that, the moniker. That's, that's the, the number that kind of it. tells us what we need to know about about our efficiency in exactly terms of, in terms of fuel consumption. Exactly. Okay, got it. So so now we've you know you mentioned that NASCAR has gone to fuel injection now, and we're looking at a picture of a of a fuel injected NASCAR engine, um, and and those. The throttle bores in that throttle body are pretty big. They are. Um, so they so are. that's part of the package that gets us that extreme efficiency out of this engine, that mm -hmm. we're, where we're getting that, that intake density, that ID number is actually above atmospheric. We're getting exactly. a, a lot of, uh, of um, air density into that engine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what happens on a restrictor plate race? I mean, this is this is something uh, this is something that's happened in the last few years with NASCAR. We've seen restrictor plates, and guys don't like them. But yeah, what happens yeah. when you throw a restrictor plate in there? Uh, it hurts the intake density. Uh huh. You know, it's decreased or throttled by the plate. Got it. So if you look at one of the plates and you look at the size of the darn thing. Uh, I mean, they've got like one inch holes in there. They're tiny little holes going through yeah. that uh, through right. that restrictor plate. So if you remember what that throttle, those butterflies look like, and you look at the holes in the plate, it's pretty amazing that the engine makes any power at all. But so it, this it, is throttling after the throttle. And, so and obviously, right. they spend a lot of time finding efficiency. Still, I mean, they're 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 still going to work on on getting some power out of this. These thing. guys are masters at plate motors. I mean. Yeah. There's guys that are just expert at that. Now, can, maybe we can let's look at some of the numbers here. What what actually happens with that restrictor plate? What what are we going to find out? It, it, what our what our horsepower output's going to be? Our our brake specific? How are we going to? What, what's that going to look like? Well, the common current uh, power output for a plate motor is about 445 horsepower. Okay. So w we put the plate in there. The engine is still pumping. 974 cubic feet same per minute. Same displacement. It's the same size engine. It never changes. You know, uh, but, but at 9400, that's what it pumps. We've lost all this horsepower, so something happened to the quality of that right. air. Right. Engine's still going the same speed. Yeah. What have, we, what have we done? We've dropped the density of every cubic foot of air that engine pumps. Got it. Got so it. if your ambient air pressure in this room is 14.7 pounds, mm -hmm and your plate motor has a pressure in the intake manifold of 9.2 pounds, that's pretty restrictive. That gives us a new intake density of 0.0476 pounds per cubic foot. So that's it's a lot less. Down. It's uh, way down. That's a lot less. I mean, that's almost half, I think. It's, if we run the numbers, that's that's darn near half of what we had well, before. Well, yeah. If we, if we look at the unrestricted uh, uh, cup engine, the 885 horse engine, a pound of, uh, 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 pardon me, a cubic foot of error is uh, 0.853. Okay, that's the weight uh, we're that's talking That's the weight, pounds. Okay. Uh, the ambient air you're running in is 0.775, and the plate motor is 0.476, which is a 44.2% decrease in intake density. Wow. Versus so that, the unrestricted. That's what happens with that restrictor plate. So exactly. So the, I think the real key there is we talked about about intake, the the quality of the intake air coming in, and we talked about restriction and all mm -hmm. these other things, and how air filters and different things like that can restrict, and how we can improve on in, on the intake air by using a ram air effect or right. these kinds of things. But this is a great illustration of, it, of it, it, it what's really actually is. happening to the density and the quality of that air going into yes. The so. You look at this and you go, okay, we've reduced the intake density, uh, so our air mass per minute is now 46.36 pounds per minute. Hmm. Uh, and now using the 13 and a half to one mm -hmm. uh, and dividing and coming up with our fuel, fuel requirement, we've got 3.43 pounds per minute. Okay. Much less. Yeah, a lot less fuel. Yeah. So we're we're going to probably get better fuel economy, but but we're the engine's just not nearly as, yeah. as powerful or as efficient. Yes, and this will show you uh, if, if if we take it to hourly requirement, it's two hundred and five point eight pounds of gasoline per hour, uh, and divide it by that brake spec number that we had before, the right. the four twenty seven. This engine should be making four hundred eighty two horsepower. It's like okay. 
we've accounted for the density change, but the actual output is 445 horsepower. What's going on? So we lost 37 horsepower somewhere. Where did it go? Basically, what it, the engine is less efficient. We have a new brake-specific number at 445 horsepower. It's a 462. Higher the number, less so efficient. So we lost some efficiency. Yeah. We've lost 8.2% uh, of the efficiency of the engine. Is it, so is that pumping loss? I mean, is that because that engine has to actually work harder to draw yeah, that air actually in? Actually, what's going on, that 30-some that horsepower you're talking about, uh -huh. That is intake suction. Yeah. That's the horsepower coming out of the crankshaft to pull those pistons down on the intake stroke. Like we talked about before. Exactly. That, that's one of those strokes that is taking power away from the crankshaft. And right? we've so, really increased the amount of power. In it this takes case, about by restricting the intake. About 37 horsepower worth right. we lost with that restrictor plate. So now we have kind of a, a feel for what negative aspects happen. When we, when we have that kind of a, a, a restriction. Right. Okay. Right. Very interesting. So back to our intake stroke. That, it, we were, when we're just dealing with our hot rods or our street vehicles, mm -hmm. we want to do everything we can to minimize restriction on the intake stroke Absolutely. so that we don't have that kind of a loss. Absolutely. Got it. And, and then, of course, the ram air effect is, is going to be a, be a benefit as well. Exactly. All for the purpose of getting more intake density. Yes. And if you look at the pumping loss and the density reduction due to the plate, you'll, you'll find the opposite of what you just said. Yeah. The, the power is reduced 48.6% in a plate motor. Interesting. And the efficiency is down 8%. It just the drops fuel, tremendously. Yeah. The fuel usage is, is worse. So the loss in total is 420 horsepower. From from everything with a from an optimal plate, engine from the optimal to a plate motor to the plate motor, 420 horsepower gone. That's that's amazing. Exactly. Yeah. So when it comes right down to it, intake density is really what we want. Exactly. And people talk about boost, mm -hmm. but that's only half of it because they're not talking about temperature. Density is dependent upon pressure and temperature. There's no density gauge on the dash of any car. Hmm anywhere but there will be because i got a patent on it <laughs> so that's coming so so the gauge once we start making the darn gauges so that uh, gauge people can say what's your idea what's your idea yeah. instead of what instead of you what's your boost with which is frankly the boost gauge is stone age yeah that's where we're at Got it. So we obviously you've mentioned boosting here. So we're going to talk about supercharging, turbocharging, and future talks um, because yeah. that's that's obviously a, a, a one really reasonable way to increase that intake density. But yeah. There's a lot more that comes along with yes. that. I know. Um, and that'll start in our next talk, which is air superiority. Got it. That's the. So we're going to take this idea talk. of density and expand on it. Yep. Fantastic. All right. So. We covered a lot of ground tonight, just talking about the four-stroke process and you know some of the dynamics that are going yes. on inside four-stroke engine. Next time, we're going to be talking about air superiority and uh, really discussing how sometimes it's good to be dense, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. So and please join us next time. We're really glad that you joined us for this. And next time, we're going to obsolete the boost gauge. So be there.